Hey everyone, Cursed Deck Builder here, making our way to 10,000 decks assisted, and right now we are looking at Volo Guide to Monsters Anti Tribal Tribal. It's our second anti deck. I do like these decks, with Volo being anti tribal because you care about different tribes as opposed to a single tribe. This deck comes to us from our longtime supporter, Kybor, who has supported the channel to bring their deck to the front of the queue. Thank you so much, Kybor. I always appreciate it. And what they say about this deck is this is a Volo deck that they're considering building at some point. They thought the effect of getting two of each creature when cast was really interesting, as well as having it an anti-tribal deck. The strategy is pretty straightforward, ramp early, play, play Volo, and start playing big creatures and double our profits that way. The few things they want to know about is mana curve, they want to see better card options for draw, single target removal, board wipes, etc. The deck isn't fully complete, it's at 96 cards, so there's still room for some extra cards without cuts. And they, of course, want to stay, if possible, one of each creature type. And I might be cheating on that just a tiny little bit, and we'll see if Kybor likes the idea. Beyond that, uh, I think uh, this deck is really, really cool. And as always, I recommend you open up the video description below where you can find the deck list and take a look for yourself to kind of see what kind of deck this is. And... While you're in there, in the video description, you can go ahead and find the form you can fill out so you can send me your own decks and I can make a video about them for YouTube. And if you want your deck to be the next deck I look at, there's a link to bring your deck to the front of the queue, just like Kybor did. So before we look at the deck list, who is Volo Guide to Monsters and why are they our anti-tribal tribal deck commander? Kyber is a 4-mana Simic 3-2 human wizard. Simic is green and blue. They say, whenever you cast a creature spell that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control, or a creature card in your graveyard, copy that spell. A copy of a creature spell becomes a token. So this is straightforwardly really, really strong, right? We're basically getting double triggers off of creatures that we play, and... I am very much so a big, you know, fan of that. I think Simic sometimes gets a bad rep. For a really long time, Simic was the uh, plus one, plus one counter colors, and now that's not really true anymore. And then for a while, it was the landfall colors. And though that's still true, I think, like, red-green has finally taken that from green-blue, uh, so that's kind of gone. And because of that, Green has been, uh, Simic has been finding a little more variety. And I think Volo is an excellent version of that variety. I think this is a really cool effect. It's very clearly strong, like you don't need to bend your head or your back around to kind of understand what's going on. You just get double creatures. And it has, uh, it has that kind of four mana that I really like. I like commanders that are four mana or below, so it's nice and low mana, comes out fast, and then you're immediately getting some advantage. So looking at the deck list, there's actually two ways to look at the deck list. This is the regular way and we'll be using that, but if you were to open this up and sort, uh, sort by subtype, you'd be able to see that we only have one of each creature type here. Um, obviously the lands are mixed in here, and then we have the instants and sorceries and enchantments that don't have subtypes. But otherwise, if we take a look around, we can see there is one type of creature for each card. Or maybe I'm saying that wrong. Each car, each creature type is only represented once. Now, of course, this is a little tricky. You have to remember that the human wizard isn't in the list because the commander isn't, for some reason, considered in the list. But human and wizard are here. And then we have to be careful because some creatures are trickier than other like wood elves here is an elf scout which makes it take up two of our cards and we might get back to cards like wood elves but um the important thing to do is think about jobs a friend of mine plays a uh what is it the the party uh deck and really really 
is obsessed with creatures having the right jobs. This deck is the exact um, is the exact opposite situation, right? I think here you want as many of your creatures to not have any form of occupation. So creatures that are just uh, fairies, creatures that are just rhinos, uh, creatures that are just serpents are all really, really good, and you want to focus on those as much as possible. Now. You do lose out on some cool creatures that way, so you do have to bend it sometimes to get stuff like Wood Elves out. And of course, our Commander Volo Guide to Monsters already breaks that rule, but it is something that's worth considering. Let's scroll down and take, uh, let's go back to the regular view. Let's scroll down and let's take a look at our curve. Now, this is something Kybor mentioned themselves, is that the curve is kind of long and five mana is a lot. And I do understand how that's kind of tricky, but I do think that's okay here. Like our deck, our deck is in ramp colors. We have a lot of ramp. And the thing is a lot of these creatures are really, really good. Uh, like Junk uh, Winder isn't at that cost and Party Tree isn't at that cost, but at eight mana, Crater Hoof Behemoth and End Race Forerunners are both great cards. Uh, I might have another suggestion there. I'm just going to make a note to myself here. Um, so, with that in mind, like these are really, really good creatures. And the fact that Volo has it on a cast trigger, so you don't even need Volo to be on the battlefield when the spell resolves, I think it's generally okay for our curve to go a bit wide. I do agree five mana is a bit high, but once again, well, we'll take a look at four and five in a second. I'm not gonna mention too many cuts, but I will say uh, we've got a lot of additions that we can put in and some cards can be cut here and there. So four mana, as always, we're gonna take a look at the mana cost that our commander matches because we want fewer cards in here if possible. But that being said, this one's kind of an exception, right? Because almost universally, you don't want to cast any of these creatures unless our commander is out. So our commander doesn't really compete in the traditional sense, right? Usually we're worried about, the, the scenarios that we're worried about is that we have a three mana black commander and like necropotence in our hands. Like that's, that's the problem. Because necropotence is so, so good, they might take precedent over our uh, commander to be played because of the power of the card, and that might not feel as good. Now, it's fine when it happens, but if your entire, if you have so many of these power level of cards that beat your commander, well, you're never going to get to play your commander. But here, our commander is not only the glue that makes the deck function, it is also, well, I guess the glue that makes the deck function. Like, all of these cards get considerably weaker. And if we look at the four drop, outside of spark double, and uh, Clever Impersonator, I think there's not really any cards that we'd cast before our commander. And Clever Impersonator and Spark Double are only cast on very, very specific boards before you cast Spike Weaver. Clever Impersonator, I think, is generally more susceptible to this because, because it's not gonna be something on your board that you wanna copy, it's gonna be something on your opponent's board. Like, if your opponent has the Smothering Tide, Necropotence, Ristic Study, that kind of thing that you really, really want, then Clever Impersonator over Volo is an acceptable cast. But since Spark Double only enters a copy of a creature or Planeswalker you control, then that, that's not really, it's gonna be really rare that you have something you wanna copy without having Volo in play to get two copies, right? So I would say outside of Clever Impersonator, these cards don't really compete. I am going to maybe suggest one or two four drops. I didn't actually end up counting, but, um, Spike Weaver. Why Spike Weaver? I get that it's a one mana fog, but if we really want that, are we not playing the frog? So I, I don't actually know if we are. Let's see, sacrifice, and then let's find frog. It isn't the fog frog, is it? What's it called? Spore frog. We're not playing a frog, I don't think so. I was originally just saying to cut this, and though I understand that the spike does give multiple fogs, uh, having to hold up mana is kind of rough, and I do really just like Spore Frog. I think it is a very fun card, and I think you'd just be pretty happy just playing this card as is, but uh, if you don't want that, I don't know. I'm not too impressed with Spike. Oops, there it is. 
the uh, Spike Weaver, especially just at that mana cost being at the same as our Commander. And four is kind of expensive for an ability that technically you need five open mana for, right? Because you want to be able to immediately I want to be able to immediately use it. So technically you need five mana open. I just generally don't particularly like this card. Uh, coming over here, we have our five mana drops. And this is the largest uh, higher mana column. So I do want to take a moment to take a look at this. And a lot of it looks really, really good. Like I have very few problems um, with these cards. I think most of them are great. The ones that kind of stick out to me is that Murkfiend Murk Liege feels a little weak. A double ramp isn't bad, which adds up to plus four, plus four on your blue-green creatures. Like, that's not bad. And it's just the other ability, I don't know to what degree without Flash. I think this is fine. I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm undervaluing this card. Maybe it's a lot stronger than I give it credit for when, when you have two of them and you can stack triggers so that you can untap with even more mana on your opponent's turn. But I don't know if we have enough instants and, source, instants and flash cards to really care about that second ability. Um, I think this is interesting. In a different version of this deck, I think, I would be like more all in on flash. I would be a lot more impressed with this card. Uh, but I don't think it needs to be taken out for that reason. Wandering Archaic is a card I really, really don't like. Um, I just, the more I think about it, every time I think about this card, I just get unimpressed. It just, it's got so many things that's not going for it. And there's so many situations where it's just gonna do nothing. And I don't think having two of them really changes it. I guess, okay, I was watching uh, a Commander podcast, Play to Win, um, and they said something along the lines, they were talking about CEDH, but they were talking about that this card only does something when your opponent makes a mistake. The mistake being forgetting that Wandering Archaic exists. And I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, either they're going to make a mistake and play a card they really shouldn't, or, you're, or they're going to play a board clear or a card that doesn't, like, get affected by Wandering Archaic, that if you make, like, you know, if there's a board clear, you just get more board clears, it doesn't do anything, and you just get your board cleared, right? And so, I don't know. I am personally not very impressed with this card, um, even, even though the fact it's actually two cards, let's flip it around, even though that it's two cards, I, I just, I don't like either of them. I don't think it particularly has earned its price tag, which if I remember correctly is higher than expected, but still, all things considered, not, not a very big fan and I would cut that. The rest of the deck looks pretty solid and once again, we're gonna go into my additions to see what I would like to add. Um, I will say, it is really fun. Like, I really do like the setup that you've chosen and I have very few cards that like, I dislike and the thing is, in most tribal decks, even the anti-tribal tribal, I don't focus on the creatures as much because the creatures are like the part the deck builder tends to think about the most. But I did think of a few that were missing. And so we'll start off with those. But before we get to the creatures, I'm gonna put one non-creature in because I think it's actually a crime to not be playing this card. And it's a long list of the ants. I don't think this card is particularly good, don't get me wrong, but it's like made for this deck, right? Like, it's the entire purpose of it. And it's a saga with six, you know, six steps on it, six chapters. That is so objectively funny to me. Will it matter to put a plus one plus one counter on your creature when you're already getting a second copy about it? Not really. But that being said, you know, if one of those creatures is Volo, it might not be so bad um, to get that effect. I think it's just cute. I think this is just like so cute that could easily go in there. And it's a fun card that you get to enjoy the way this deck works with a card like this. So this one, I don't know how serious of a recommendation it is, but it is a recommendation nonetheless. Okay, so what are we looking at? Well, one creature type that I m noticed 
I'm just typing out the other one that is missing is Eldrazi. So the easiest one that I could I could find is It That Betrays. Now the Eldrazi uh, usually have cast triggers, which both is interesting with Volos because Volos uh, himself has a cast trigger, but it also means that the copy doesn't get the cast trigger. And I think It That Betrays is the strongest Eldrazi without a cast trigger. And so that is the one that has kind of caught my eye. It is 12 mana, it is, but it is really strong, and it's something to consider. However, I have an alternative one that I think might be a little better, but it requires a change on your part. See, you already have a boar in end, uh, what is it? End raise forerunners. What if instead you played Decimator of Provinces? This has, it takes up Boar and it takes up Eldrazi, so it is a double creature type, but what it has, it doesn't have haste, which I think is a bit of a problem, mind you, but what it has instead is that it has Emerge. So you can cast this spell for a lot less than 10 or one would imagine nine mana. Now you're going to have creatures to emerge from because the tokens, and this is going to come up again, but the tokens have the same mana cost as their original versions, and therefore, with that in mind, you can sacrifice a token version of a creature that you don't need as much, and you can cut down on this mana cost tremendously, right? If you sacrifice a 5 mana creature, which you have a lot of, all of a sudden you have a 4 mana decimator of provinces. You get a second version, and oh it does have haste! I don't, I don't know why. Is it because it doesn't give other creatures haste? That's probably why. But I think that's only in comparison to, I don't know if Enraze has that too. Yeah, Enraze doesn't have that either. Interesting. It has vigilance and this doesn't. Um, so by losing Vigilance, you are getting an easier to cast creature. Uh, your creatures get plus four, plus four, and trample. Um, already, uh, already a strong effect that the other card does. But basically, we're trading in Vigilance for a cheaper mana cost. And I personally really, really like that. I think that solves the problem that you were thinking of, of the mana cost starting to get high. And though this is a 10 cost, I think it is a very, very cool card. Uh, I really, really like the Emerge creatures. I would love to see more Emerge creatures. I'm hoping in Modern Horizons 3, but until then, this is an option that I think is interesting. Another higher mana green card just got printed is Gruff Triplets with Seder Warrior, two types you're not using either. Now this one works really, really well because each of them creates two copies of itself which means when you play this card, you are getting six copies of this creature. You give them haste, you attack, and every single one of, when one of them dies, the rest of them get stronger. I really, really like this card in this deck. I, I saw this card before in a previous deck that I didn't like as much, but this, when you can guarantee getting six, oh, if it isn't a token, hold on, hold on. Reading the card explains the card. If you use this card, you only get four with Volo, not six. Never mind, we can get rid of this card. I'm so sorry. The heartbreak is real. Moving on. <laughs> Solemn Simulacrum is noticeably absent here, and you don't have a Golem. And Solemn Sim Simulacrum is like the poster child of a card that likes to ETB and die. Um, getting two lands onto the battlefield is really good. And I don't think you want to cast this without Volo out, or you want to cast this when Volo is in the command zone and maybe cost six so that you can get to that sixth mana to cast him. So, though it's four mana, I think this is a pretty easy inclusion. Just uh, another creature that ramps you and draws cards, and it isn't a creature type you don't have. So I do really like that, and I think it's an easy addition. A not as easier uh, addition would be something like Toski Bearer of Secrets. Now, Toski does have the, the setup where you don't have any other squirrels in your deck, and therefore Toski can be played, but it is legendary and therefore will not get a token copy. So, not so great. That being said, 
This is a very, very good card draw engine. You play Toski, you use all those extra copies of creatures that you have to attack an opponent who can't block, and every time you deal damage, you draw a card. This is a very, very strong ability. And I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not to play it, but I think it's very, very strong. It is a bit of a nombo, but that's fine. I think, I think this will be the, f the first real card that competes with your commander, that if you have you know, a setup with two or three creatures because of uh, land ramp on turn three, on turn four, you might actually want to play uh, Toski instead of your commander, which could be really interesting to draw a bunch of cards and play your commander after. That's something to consider. Uh, let's see what's next. Uh, this is five mana. I know you felt like you had a lot of five mana ones, but Keeper of Fables is also really, really strong. A very similar ability to Toski. You don't have any cats. And I and remember, you have to... This one's just less. It's like per player you hit. But with one... Like, you just need to hit one player with one creature. That's three creatures. If they have evasion, it'll be really easy. Uh, I just think this card is really good. Then obviously, when doubled, that's two, two draws per creature. And that's really, really nice. And, as obvious, the only human in your deck is Volo, and therefore the rest of your creatures trigger this, which is really, really nice. Another strange one about card draw, and you might notice a lot of these are themed for card draw to answer that card draw problem, is Sea Dasher Octopus. Sea Dasher Octopus is really interesting to me because you can mutate it onto a creature but that's still being cast, so you'll still get the second copy, who, which I believe will not be able to be mutated because that one is just being cast as a regular copy of the spell, but I'm not too sure because mutate is a nightmare of a mechanic. However, you can flash this in end of your last opponent's end step. You'll get two, two you'll either get a mutate, which I think is ideal because it's cheaper to do it this way, or you'll get two octopi. Uh, you attack an opponent with both of them, ideally an opponent who's tapped out or unable to block, and then you draw two cards, easy peasy, really nice. And as mentioned, you can mutate this onto a creature that has a particularly strong uh, form of evasion or a strong body, and you will have really good results with it. So I think this is an easy inclusion as well for card draw and kind of shenanigans, because it's an octopus, that's pretty fun. Let's see, uh, more into card draw. These, there's a lot of card draw, obviously. I, I, I focused on it because I agree with you, card draw is really, really nice. And I do think that with enough card draw, the ramp situation and the, the mana curve situation gets easier because with more cards, you have more lands and you see more of your deck for cards to play. But coming back to this, we have Fibblethip the Lost. Fibblethip is great because you are okay with him being a legendary and getting two copies because uh, you just need the ETB. So you can just sacrifice the token and then you'll draw two for one and a blue. And I think that's pretty good. Uh, there's also like the upside that you can, if Flibbletip Fib is targeted probably by you for any reason, it gets shuffled back into your deck and it is possible for you to draw him again at some point and get another two draws. I don't think it's real, but like, it's pretty, it's pretty good. All in all, I was looking for some kind of wall of flowers effect, and I think this is probably the best one that you can play and get away with that doesn't take up relevant creature types. So, Thibblethip is the one I suggest. Let's see. Now, the next few I have... Well, let's start with this. This is competing with Thopter, which you're using Ornithopter of Paradise, but if you felt you needed even more card draw, Skyscanner is also just a really nice, you know, simple play it, draw a card kind of creature. It's three mana, which isn't ideal, but it does work particularly well. Now these next two, one of them is also a Thopter, so I want you to consider that, but these next two are more specific into theming variations of Volos. I don't I don't recommend them for this deck, but there's something to think about, especially if people are looking to build other types of Volos decks. Or Volo decks, sorry. Uh, Thought Monitor. Oh, Thought Monitor is a construct. That's right. I keep thinking it's a Thopter. 
Sorry, Thought Monitor is a construct. You can play it. But the thing is, it does need a lot of artifacts to be played. Now, you can make a few changes here and there. You could put the artifact lands into the deck. Uh, you could play the artifact dual land in the deck. Cards like that will make it a little easier. But I don't know the feasibility of this card. Like, it is... It's good. Let, let's get that out of the way. This card is really, really good with Volo. You don't have a construct. And when this comes into play at, like, remember this mana can be reduced really low depending on how many artifacts you have, it will draw you four cards and give you two, two, two flyers. flyers. That's honestly just really, really good. I think you're really happy with a card like this, but you will have to consider, you will have to consider exactly how that's going to work out. Uh, with the artifacts that you want. Maybe this belongs in a build that has more clues, more treasure tokens, things like that. I think it's very doable, and I think you could even just play it here and pretend it's like a five drop where you can reduce it by two, e like most likely you'll be reducing it by two mana, but I'll leave that to you to consider. Likewise, on the opposite end for enchantments, Eidolon of Blossoms, which you don't have a spirit card, uh, is, in, is also really interesting because the way it works is that when you play this, you're going to draw three cards. So it's four mana, three cards by itself, right? Where the first one comes in, draws a card. Then the second one sees the, fir uh, the first one sees the second one come in, draws you a card. And then the second one coming in draws you the third card, which is just really, really good. It is at four mana, which is a little rough, but then... And I think this is what I'm, uh, the, what I specifically mean of the build, build around. We only have six enchantments right now, unfortunately. If we had more and we had more enchantment creatures, I think I'd be a lot. It'd be a lot easier to suggest this. But what I'll leave it at is this is a three, four mana draw three with your commander out. When it's not out, it's a four mana cycle, which isn't as good. So. If you were ever going to consider playing more enchantments, I think this would be a very, very easy inclusion. Let me see. What am I... I've got one more creature that I think sticks out as a creature that you are not playing, and then we're going to go to non-creatures. Uh, at a very similar mana cost, uh, being very high, we have Lord of Change. Lord of Change draws three by itself. It is a flying ward 6-6 six, six as well, ward 3-6-6, six, six, which is nothing to laugh at. But if you have Volo out and you cast this, it is draw six. And that is really, really impressive. The problem is, is that is a lot of mana. It is seven mana to cast this creature. And like, I would definitely pay seven mana to draw six cards though and get two six sixes. Forget about it. That's really great. Uh, it is a lot of mana, and I think I'm going to give you some more ramp, but I think I'll leave it to you to decide. The ceiling is really, really high on this card, though, and the floor is it just it just rots in your hand. But with a few more ramp inclusions, I think this is very reasonable, and this is one of those cards that you're actually kind of, kind of okay with just casting without Volo, because drawing three just generally is just is just good enough, right? You'll be really happy with that. All right, and I have one card that shares creature types in the deck that I think is still worth playing despite that, and you may have guessed it. Yes, it is our other, oops, our other Volo. Volo, oh, uh, what is that word? Itinerant, itinerant scholar, like an itinerary? That makes sense. Volo, itinerant scholar. So Volo is just obviously a copy of our commander, uh, a different version, but the same creature, so that's flavorful. But also, its ability is really, really cute. You create yourself the uh, journal, and then as you cast creatures with different creature types, you you grow the journal, and eventually with Volo, you tap him and draw a bunch of cards. Obviously, you are okay with Volo not being uh, triggering Volo because he's legendary, and also he's Volo, right? Like, it's the whole idea. Uh, I also think it's really funny to have two Volos in a Volo deck. But nonetheless, I think this ability is really strong. If you want to be in flavor, if you think it's cute, I think it's definitely worth playing. Uh, if you're playing a long list of Ents, 
you should definitely be playing this Volo. It, they have the same kind of theming to them as something being really cute and fun. All right, let's move on to uh, let's move on to non-creature spells. Now let's do removal first because I'm only really suggesting one card. Uh, when it came to removal, you're wondering if we had enough. The only other card that I thought could be added in here would be, let's see, our Raven, Raven form, which will turn a creature into a, or an artifact or a creature into a 1-1 one, one while exiling it. That's really the only type of like direct removal I think you're really missing. You are playing all of the best removal in blue and green, and I don't really think you need more. You are the aggressor in a deck like this. Like when you go and you, when your deck is functioning, you are playing so many creatures, drawing so many cards, you're getting really far ahead. It is up to other, uh, other players to take you out of the game. And because of that, I think something worth consider, uh, considering is actually instead of proactive uh, cards, maybe a few reactive cards, which uh, you can use you can use to protect Volo. Because I think keeping Volo is a lot more important than destroying your opponent's creatures, in my opinion. But I'll leave that to you to decide. The one removal spell that I thought you could play pretty easily is Oversimplify, which is Blue Green's main board clear. I know they have a few others, but I think this one, I really do like this one. Five mana leaves everyone with a big creature. I think that's particularly fine. You are almost guaranteed to have the biggest creature outside of, uh, uh, oh, it's total power too. Oh, I love math. Yeah, odds are you will have one of the bigger fractals. And nothing says you have to cast this on turn five, right? If you cast this and then drop another creature, you know, just, just a two mana creature, you now have a blocker for the other fractals, uh, assuming your fractal isn't the biggest to begin with. And if you wanted to put more removal in the, in the way of bounce spells, that works obviously really, really well with fractals because once you bounce them, they're gone. But I think this is a really cool card. I think the effect is very, very strong and you'd be happy to play it. The exile on this, I think, is very, very relevant. Its ability to get rid of boards with aristocrats players around is really important. You can definitely, this, this gets you around situations where you have the, the creature power to defeat a player, but because of aristocrats, you would lose the game through all of those attacks. Uh, and this this lets you deal with those situations when they don't have a sack outlet pretty, pretty well. All right, the next blue-green card I want to take a look at is Double Major. Double Major is, to, is a card that copies target creature spell you control, except for it isn't legendary if the spell is legendary. Now, I think this is interesting because in theory, you can copy Volos with Volo with this, and get multiple triggers, which I think is really, really cool. But the main reason I want it is it's a form of redundancy with our commander. Our deck is built around the fact that our creatures are coming down in twos, and when our commander is gone, having another way to do this is really, really nice. It's not what I would consider a particularly strong card, but I think in a deck like this, it makes a lot of sense. So I would, I would consider it for sure. Another card that I think is not particularly strong but is interesting here is Combine Chrysalis. Now, we're really playing it for that first line of text that says creature tokens you control have flying. Uh, the rest where you sacrifice a token to make a 4-4 as a sorcery, you're probably not going to do that. But a green and a blue to make half, quote unquote, half our creatures fly is interesting. I don't particularly like it to be honest but I wanted to suggest it anyways. It's not quite win more, but it's almost win more because it just helps you when your commander is out, like you need your commander out to get this effect. But that being said, getting even at least one trigger off Volo is pretty easy. And that Combine Chrysalis is gonna give that token created flying. For two mana and a card, uh, it's okay. It's really okay. Obviously it works a lot better with certain creatures where like Toski, where getting that evasion matters quite a bit, but I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. 
Another card that I think is kind of interesting is Threats Undetected. This is a card that I uh, I usually don't like because it's it's uh, it's a copy of a better card with a worse ability. These un uh, like these gifts ungiven style cards usually put cards into the graveyard, but it seems like they finally had enough of that, and now the rest are being shuffled back into your deck, which is kind of a bummer. But I think it's still good enough. It's still a pseudo divination. You know, you're gonna draw two creatures. And you get to pick your opponent, which means you can make a deal with it with some politics. But if you need like card draw, let's say, you cast this and get, you know, reveal four card draw engines. Or if you need like to set up ramp, you cast this and you reveal four ramp creatures. So I don't think it's particularly bad. I'll leave it up to you. I think this is borderline. Uh, I haven't played with it myself. And in a deck like this, you'd need to play with it to kind of figure out exactly how strong it's going to be. Something on the other hand that I think is quite strong is Invasion of Ikoria. Um, what is this at? This is at six bucks American. I think this is very, very reasonable to buy. And what it's going to do is it's going to, um, it's going to tutor a creature out of your deck or graveyard onto the battlefield. Now, this doesn't work with Volo, right? You're not casting the creature, you're just tutoring it out. But I think it's still worth playing. Its effect is really, really strong because you get to pull out, let's say, like Lotus Cobra or like a ramp card or like a draw engine, and you'll be pretty happy with the results. On the other side, when you do flip this card, which you can definitely do, um, it's the fact that all of your non-human creatures can assign damage as if they weren't blocked is just really, really strong with, once again, Volo being your only non-human, or your only human creature in the deck. And with that in mind, I think this is just really, really strong. I like that it has reach. I think that's very, very funny. Um, but I think this is a card that could definitely be played. You'd have to figure out what you regularly want to tutor, because once you pull it out, you can't really use it with Volo. So that's something that's a little rough, but I think you'll definitely have targets. Then I've got, very similarly, Neoform. But I like Neoform a little more, because as mentioned before, our tokens have the same converted mana cost as their originals, and therefore you can sacrifice a token pretty easily and go and get the next mana cost creature. I'm thinking specifically of something like Solemn Simulacrum, but honestly, there's a lot of choices in your deck that I think you'd be pretty happy to sacrifice to get a higher mana version tutored into play. Once again, you won't get two copies of it, but I think the effect is still strong enough, especially with, uh, with Volo off the battlefield, you'll be happy to have this. But beyond that, I think you'll generally be very happy to play a card like this in, in this deck. I'm just thinking of a situation where like, you have Wood Elves out, you've, ca uh, you've cast it, where, where is it? You've cast Wood Elves, and then you're gonna use this to tutor, you know, like Clever Impersonator into the battlefield to copy something, right? Uh, and I think that itself is strong enough to do this. And I think you'd be pretty happy. Or Toski, right? Because Toski already cannot have a copy of itself. So getting a 2-2 indestructible uh, or 2-2 version of this card is really, really good. Um, two cards before our last card that are really easy. Cultivate and Kodama's Reach. It's kind of a shame to put these so late into this list they're really simple cards, but when it comes to ramp, you could play them. You seem to be kind of concerned about ramp and your curve. Kodama's Reach and Cultivate work better when you are trying to hit higher mana types regularly. And so having them around is nice. You're already playing the two mana uh, ramp that I would play with Volos being our four mana commander, but it doesn't hurt to play even just one of these for the ability of hopefully getting to five or six mana, a card like this is really, really good. And the last card I'd like to name that's kind of on my mind is Elven Farsight. I think, I think this is interesting. You, you, you can see Gimli from across the room. I've never actually looked at this art. This art is so funny to me. I know it's supposed to be that they're predicting that Gimli's showing up, but I really like the idea that it just shows you, you know, 10 meters, maybe not even, like eight meters ahead of you. 
<laughs> it's it's literally far sight by eight meters. That's very very funny to me. But all right, so scry three, reveal the top card if it's a creature, draw a card. Uh, with this many creatures in your deck, and the fact that you're playing off of the creatures that you play with a lot, you know, a lot of them being cyclers or draw engines, it allows you to keep going. I think the scry and the draw is really really good. If you consider the fact that Preordain, which is Scry 2 and Draw, is really good, and this is a card that wants to... That's, this is a card in a deck that wants to draw creatures, and it's Scry 3 and Draw, I mean, that's really, really good. Obviously, if you Scry 3 to the bottom, you might not flip a creature, but with 32 creatures in a 100-card deck, I think the odds are rather good. So I would potentially take that risk if I had to. So I think this would be a fine inclusion of just, you know, kind of a preparation card, kind of a get through your deck, looking for the right threats kind of card. And I think that's generally the things I want to say, where, where is our, yeah, uh, about Volo. I really like Volo. I think Volo is a really, really interesting commander. I think a very fun commander to play with. If you've never sat down with a Volo player, it is something really to experience as it is playing in a way that you might not expect. As I said before, I don't have a lot of cuts. I have a few cards that I've put in as replacements or adjustments. I really don't like that spike. I think that's the main card I do want to cut. We can change the boar into an Eldrazi boar, but otherwise I've given quite a few cards and different ideas to do uh, depending on what you want to cut. I'll leave that to you to make the final cuts because it is tricky with a creature deck uh, where the types do really matter, but I'd say honestly find the ones that are the most fun to you and put those in first. Solemn Simulacrum works really well with Volo, but it's kind of a boring card, so it's up to you in the end to decide which ones you're going to adjust and put in. Likewise, on the topic of board clears, I think... Um, Simplify is fine. The exile is very relevant. I don't think the fractals is going to be too bad for you. And on targeted removal, I would honestly prefer protection for Volo because I do think that you are the aggressor and you will have a better time being in control of the game. Finally, um, ramp, right. Finally, ramp. I think ramp is already really good. I've looked through the deck. I think the ramp is fine. I think the mana curve is fine. It's to be expected that the deck kind of works this way. I would I would definitely, t uh, if you ever put it together, test it a few times to see if the ramp is right, but I, I have a feeling that it's already right. Um, if not, we can add in the Cultivate and Kodama's Reach to get a little more, but with the card draw available, I think you're gonna be okay. One of the things is, is that card draw and ramp kind of compete with each other because they end up doing very similar things in the long run. Ramp is good for getting you out early uh, and letting you play and see more of your deck. And card draw likewise does that, but just backwards where you're just guarantee a land drop every turn. And eventually you will have the most lands as long as you keep drawing cards. As always, thank you so much, Kaibor, for supporting the channel and sending this deck. I really like it. I hope to see another draft of it sometime, and I hope you can build it in, in uh, paper or online or what have you, because Volo is so, so, so much fun. If you have another draft of this deck or any deck you'd like me to take a look at, there is a link in the, descriptions below, uh, in the description below in order to send it my way. And if you would like to bring your deck to the front of the, licks, uh, the list, Ah, as uh, Kybor did. <laughs> this is this is the first deck of the Monday. It's always it's always the toughest one to read out. There is a link in the description to bring your deck to the front of the list. If you'd like to like, comment, subscribe, please do that. Our channel is always growing, and it's always really nice to see new faces. Thank you so much for the deck, Kybor, and good luck improving it.